Hello everyone, we're going to look at the church history, the major events that's happened from 1900 to the present, and, and look at how the church has transformed um, from the little white country church to, to what's going on today. And there's so many different movements that's occurred and major key players, we can't hit everything. It seems that the closer we get to the present, the more and more details of major things that influence the church. So uh, we'll just we'll hit some of the major things that I, at least stood out to me. So I apologize if there's things that, that I, I missed that you feel were important. So, um, But please uh, engage in your own study and follow the rabbit holes of, of things that are still influencing our church today. Okay, so in Juso Gonzalez's church history book that we've been using, it's described that in 1750, a fifth of the world professed faith in Jesus. And we had the Bible in 60 languages. By 1900, a third uh, of the population professed faith. And we had the Bible in 537 languages. Uh, in 1908, they established the Federal Council of Churches that mainly dealt and worked together over labor issues. Uh, so they decided, well, well, why not get together for the spread of the gospel to the rest of the nations? And there was a council two years later in Edinburgh that with 95% of the representatives were from the United States and Great Britain. Um, and they were looking at what, what doctrines, what things do we need to downplay so in order that we could work together and they found that they were in 85% of agree in agreement on doctrinal issues. So um, this is going to be kind of the forerunner of the ecumenical movement of kind of churches coming together. We're going to see different movements that are pushing toward this throughout the this hundred years of church history. So in this time, there was really too broad of theology uh, between the different groups and too much theological liberalism for everyone to work together like they had hoped. There was a liberal magazine in the time of this day that um, said it wasn't the faithful, but rather relevance and harmony with modern developments that was what was important. There was a liberal theologian, Adolf Harnack, that he stressed the universal fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man, and the infinite work of the human soul. Um, on the other side of the fence, you had um, you had someone that was more um, of a fundamentalist that had written and said that I described this time period looking at in America said that they they preached a God without wrath that brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of Christ without a cross. Um, Back on the liberal side, Henry Fosdick was a Presbyterian pastor that had written a, a document that said, Shall the Fundamentalists Win? And Rock, John D. Rockefeller liked this guy's teaching and funded the publishing of his pamphlets and even funded a, a, a new church so in Manhattan to give Fosdick a, a place to preach. In his farewell message, he preached about tolerance and inclusion, an inclusive church um, and really interpreting religion through modern terms and their social applications of Jesus' principles. On the other side, uh, more traditional, more um, fundamentalist teaching um, has written a document called Theological Liberalism that really he described it, Machen described it as a totally different religion that didn't even believe the basics about Jesus. So you're going to see in, this, in the 20s here of this growing rift between the fundamentalist and the modernist or the ones that were more of a theological liberal stance on the church and society. And so the fundamentalists swing toward really being known what they were against and what they were for and rallied over issues of evolution versus creation in the, in this day and their fight for prohibition. As far as people that, that their teachings influenced the church, uh, I really believe C.I. Schofield is one of the biggest influencers at this time period. Uh, he worked as an attorney for in the state of Kansas and then a lawyer in Missouri, but he's converted at age 36 he serves as a pastor in Dallas, Texas, and then he uh, is a pastor at the Moody Church after D.L. Moody. And he was majorly influenced originally uh, by Brooks, who we mentioned before had been the guy that had invited Nelson Darby to preach and passed on the dispensational th theology and really the initial teaching of the, the there's going to be the church was going to be raptured and then followed by seven years of tribulation and then followed by the millennial reign that is much of the hallmark of the end times theology that, that we we grew up with. And he Schofield popularized this dispensational teaching in his study Bible that he published in 1909. And so at this same time period, you had D.L. Moody was preaching and, and spreading uh, spreading a lot of this theology. 
uh, I heard this quote, and I, I really tried to track down where it came from. I couldn't, I found different versions of it, but so I can't find the original author. But it said, My hope is built on nothing less than Schofield's notes and Moody Press. So this, this dispensational thinking and its view of the end times is, is what you see spread all across churches in, uh, in America, especially in this area. And it really started with, with John Nelson Darby and then bringing it to America, then popularized by Schofield. Another major influencer was Billy Sunday. He was a baseball player from Iowa and really brought in ideas of entertainment with his ministry. This was the same time period as the Red Scare. And, and he said that the deportation of radicals uh, in reference to the communist uh, spreading was too easy of a punishment. And the one that should be costly to the nation and said he, they, instead they should be rounded up and lined up and shot. Um, in this time period, you saw, many saw lack of church membership as you had anti-American inclinations. He was all, he was a main crusade leader and would have many like of the tent revival kind of meetings known for his fire and brimstone messages, brought heavy, heavy moralizing messages mixed with political overtones. And this is this was his invitation was marked with people walking down the sawdust trail. So there was sawdust lined in the aisles of the tabernacles where he would be, or the tabernacle where he preached. Uh, um, and so people would walk down the sawdust trail to receive salvation. And he popularized the idea of just publicly shaking his hand as a profession of faith and that uh, an acknowledgement that they would follow Christ. And so many copied his methods uh, uh, after him. So he really took some of of the pre of Charles Finney's methods of the invitation and the altar call, and then just and you're going to continue to see those evangelistic practices kind of uh, transformed in this hundred years of the church history. Uh, an influencer that's not an American uh, person in this timeline, but Carl Barth, um, we're looking from 1886 to 1968. He was a he had a liberal education in Berlin, but then he shifts away from his training. He really just from what I was reading about, he really transformed his thinking throughout his life. But it was his commentary on Romans that was a bombshell in the theologian's playground, as it was described, that challenged the theological liberalism in Europe that he learned from his professors. And he kind of um, started what was known as neo-orthodoxy. Uh, and he insisted on faithful exegesis of the scripture rather than systematic constructions. And that's kind of why I wanted to mention him. Uh, he saw that there was this big gap between time and eternity between human achievements and divine action which was the opposite of where the theological liberalism was putting the emphasis on human achievement not God's divine action and so he wrote a document called Christian dogmatics and then later he ends up uh, revising it uh, he thought the first one had too much philosophy in it and refocused more on the scriptures so he wrote his final version of called church dogmatics he, he said that it, instead that theology, theology was no matter how true or correct, always remained a human endeavor and therefore must be seen with a combination of freedom, joy, and even humor. And I kind of think it reminds me of Luther's idea of not writing a systematic theology because he didn't want to put his doctrines in little boxes that didn't influence each other. So rather than putting all of your doctrines of, say, baptism in one box, rather than to focus on just the systematic uh, reading of Scripture uh, and allowing it to be your your basis uh, for doctrine and trying not to put all your doctrine in one neat box where everything's explained perfectly. Another guy that's mainly uh, known for his work during the World War II era, um, he was killed in, in during this time, he was uh, executed uh, just a few days before the troops came in and captured the prison where he was being held. Um, Diedrich Bonhoeffer, uh, he, he was influenced mainly by, by Barth and his teaching, although he he written some things that disagree with him later in his life. He, in, in New York, um, uh, he described that they preach everything except the gospel of Jesus Christ and the cross, uh, sin, forgiveness, death, and life. 
So he saw the theological liberalism that was being spread in America in his time as well and didn't like it. He visits uh, America and in Harlem, he, and he hears the gospel that he was looking for. He ends up becoming a Christian. And meanwhile, Hitler had started his his regime, and um, all the German Protestants were he were kind of established into a pro-Nazi denomination. And so Karl Barth and 5,000 other people resist this movement and written what was the Barman Declaration, that their faith was in Jesus uh, as Savior and Lord. And so Bonhoeffer ends up going back to Germany to help, uh, hopefully to help with uh, the war effort and to help rebuild after the war. He he writes a, a famous book called The Cost of Discipleship, which I've read part of. I need to finish. Um, it writ, written a few other things, but that's his main famous work. Um, it, it was found his name was in plans to assassinate Hitler, and he he's arrested in 1943 and spends time in prison and eventually moved to a concentration camp. And as I said, was executed just a few days before uh, the prison is captured by the Allies. So kind of before the war, there was uh, World War II this time period, there was three main options. Either you were a fundamentalist, a liberal, or this blend of, of neo-orthodoxy, somewhere in the middle. And so there was the World Council of Churches in 1948. There were mostly liberal and neo-orthodox representatives, and they had decided they brought in the Russian Orthodox Church um, into this fold. And, but their confession was kind of too sketchy for fundamentalists. So in 1942, there was the National Association of Evangelicals. There was an offshoot of the fundamentalism. And so they kind of branched off into a neo-evangelical, and eventually the neos left off and so they become known as evangelical churches and they knew that there was this uh the church the fundamentalist church churches before had been known so much for what they were against so you kind of shift a little bit uh back toward a little bit of social involvement and not a total disconnect from culture and this was the time period of the tent revivals of Billy Graham. And we'll talk about more about Billy Graham here in a minute. And they, he brought multiple denominations together and preached the message of salvation. Um, a guy named Carl Henry said that the uneasy conscience of modern fundamentalism, uh, this was a document he'd written, that fundamentalism had become so caught up in avoiding liberalism that they disengaged from culture altogether. So there was a conference in, in 1975 that Billy Graham had chaired called the Lassane uh, Covenant, and they held that the Bible is the only infallible rule of faith and practice. And again, just some of these different conferences and 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 groups that have gathered, and some of their main things they worked on is all I'm representing. I'm sure, I know there's way more that, that was discussed and, and that came about of these. Another one, the Manhattan Declaration in 2009, there was 150 church leaders from Catholic and Protestant and that focused on social issues that they had agreed on. And these three main ones being the sanctity of life, the dignity of marriage, and freedom of religion. Uh, and they had agreed to engage in civil disobedience of the government had mandated or asked that they violate these moral issues. Uh, one a major theologian at this time period here, uh, D.A. Carson, uh, described this uh, these late 1900s in early 2000s, you have one generation ends up proclaiming the gospel clearly, the next assumes that gospel, and then the next generation neglects the gospel altogether. Uh, and there was a need for each generation to clearly proclaim the gospel because that's the means by which uh, Jesus preserves and perpetuates his church. So that is kind of like the the end of the Justo Gonzalez's uh story of Christianity and some of the major things that pull out of those final chapters that I want to represent here. So Billy Graham, one of the fa most famous evangelists of this past century, uh, for, lived from 1918 to 2018, and is known for his evangelistic crusades. He established an evangelistic Associ association of 1950. Um, he popularly he still continued this ever-changing practice of an altar call, but he had trained counselors that would help people accept Christ as their Savior, and he employed a pamphlet called Four Steps to Peace with God, which was really an adapted version of Billy Sunday's pamphlet of Four Things God Wants You to Know, which was followed by uh, a prayer of decision, um, much of what now we most people call a sinner's prayer. He was also used a, a radio broadcast for years. It was called The Hour of Decision. 
It is estimated that around 2.2 million people have responded to an invitation to become a Christian through the Billy Graham's uh, evangelistic crusades. So in here on the bottom right, you see different versions of this prayer that is used in conjunction with an altar call or an invitation that says, Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. This uh, saw different slight variations that Billy Graham used, but this is the main gist uh, of the one that I saw he used. And you see different phrases from this prayer used in different time periods and still used today. So another evangelist, uh, much like Billy Graham and, and these guys knew each other, um, a guy, Bill Bright, and he established an organization called Crew, or known as Campus Crusade for Christ in 1951. And he is known for his pamphlet, this Four Spiritual Laws, that he published in 1956. Uh, and his organization publishes the Jesus Film in 1979. And if you are, if you're trying to like research people groups that have been reached, or if you have any kind of an app that is like a prayer uh, app for nations that are unreached in the spread of the gospel, one of the things that is documented that you'll see in these countries is whether they have the Jesus film published in their language or not, along with the Bible in their language. Um, and his four spiritual laws, this is what he had popularized, that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Man is sinful and separated from God and can't know and experience God's love and plan for his life. Jesus Christ is God's only provision for man's sin. Through him you can know and experience God's love and plan for your life. And we must individually receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Then we can know and experience God's love and plan for your life. And, and again, followed by a version of a sinner's prayer of people that want to accept or invite Jesus into their heart. So different evangelistic practices that have really transformed, really uh, in conjunction with an invitation of Charles Finney's day to the present time. So here, just lastly, and this, there's, these are people that are still influencing the church. Um, I just put the, these are people that have influenced me, and I know there's tons of other people that have writing that have that are just dead and gone in the last uh, couple of decades that are major influencers. I know my dad really likes Oliver B. Green, and there's so many. Uh, the different people that have passed in this century that have influenced the church. These are some of the people that I just uh, have read or been exposed to from, from Charles Stanley to John Piper, John MacArthur and Francis Chan and Louis Giglio at the Passion Conference. Uh, David Platt, I really like and, and are still, he's a pastor in at DC where he just last uh, couple of years had the opportunity to pray for Trump at his church. Um, so, and, and just by way of discussion, I'll put this in the discussion questions. Who's the major people that have influenced you in your thinking and your theology uh, from this past century? Um, and how, uh, really, how are these people, how are the people that are major writers, authors, pastors, and theologians of our day, how are they going to influence the church for the next generation? Uh, and how will they fit into the context of church history? So, that's it for the, for this video, and we'll probably have a review video that I'll send out that hits the major events of the timeline uh, next week. Uh, I hope that was helpful.